welcome back to another episode of Dr. Me First. It's me, your colleague in medicine, coach in life, queen of burnout, throwing in a little sass there, Dr. freaking Aaron Wiseman. I got to practice what I preach. I'm a recovering workaholic and rest is my detox. <laughs> so my team is pushing me to try to do more rest. I have really been invigorated since I got my new office and my podcasting equipment set up back full time. It's been so fun to be podcasting again and doing live episodes. But they're reminding me too that I'm overworking. So we are problem solving this. And in order to do that, we are doing a reboot showcase. All my work that I've done in the past, I might as well reuse it, right? Recycle, reduce, reuse. And so what we're going to do in this reboot showcase is take old podcast episodes that I've actually been on for other people and play them here on Dr. Me First. It makes me smile a little bit as I go back and listen to years ago when I was doing some of these podcasts. And I'm like, wow, I was really smart. I knew a whole lot of things. But I also see how I've changed and how things are different. <laughs> In the world of Aaron Wiseman, we call it, is it long-haired Aaron or short-haired Aaron? Because <laughs> you can definitely see a big change when the hair got lopped off during the pandemic. So listen to the episodes and then see if you can tell when I did that episode on the timeline of everything Aaron Wiseman. Long-haired Aaron, short-haired Aaron. Give me an email. I'd love to hear about it. I'm going to take my own medicine, I'm going to rest a little bit, and I'm still going to pop up episodes for you to listen to. So enjoy this reboot today. And as always, friend, remember, your life, your calling, your pulse absolutely matters. And the badass in me honors the freaking badass in you. Enjoy! Hi, I'm Kara Pepper. As a physician, coach, and friend, I hear about people's most intimate life experiences. As they describe the tough things they privately struggle with, they all say the same thing. I thought it was just me. Being human can feel hard and lonely, but you know what? I have a unique perspective in seeing how similar we all are. We all have a story. This podcast shares the struggles of amazing humans. These are their survival stories. They share them because you never know when your story will become someone else's survival guide. It's not just you. Hi, and welcome back. I'm so glad you're here. When I was about seven years into my clinical practice, I was epically burned out. I could not get out of bed. And I told my practice I needed to take a leave. I was exhausted, and I was absolutely numb. Work had been my drug to numb for so long that I absolutely felt nothing. And I think that's one of the reasons I had pushed as far as I did before I finally raised the white flag and said I needed to take a break. So on the last day of work, before I took time off, I had a partner ask me, well, why don't you just take medication? You know, just take a pill and keep on going. And the problem was I wasn't anxious or depressed. I was numb. I mean, what would a pill have treated? I felt nothing. And so it's in that space that so many patients, coaching clients and friends, colleagues come to me and you say, how are you? And they're like, not great. And they may not even know what version of not great they are. They just know they feel terrible. And so it takes someone from the outside looking in sometimes to tease out, is this occupationally induced burnout? Is this a mood disorder like depression, anxiety? Is this a normal human reaction to the world that we live in? Sometimes it's hard to tell. And so today we're going to hear from Dr. Aaron Wiseman, who's a family doc in rural Indiana, married to a fourth generation farmer, one of four docs in her county, the only non-male physician in her county. And you'll hear what it was like for her as she began to work for the Atta Girl which felt so good and how she pushed to her absolute maximum for so long. 
and what it took to tease out what was really going on with her. She is quite famous for talking about burnout and working with burned out physicians, but the acknowledgement that there was something more than burnout going on with her took her years. As part of her story, she will briefly describe suicidality. So if that's not appropriate for you to listen to today, please care for yourself and I'll see you next week. Glad you're here. I can thoroughly 100% now see the interplay of my severe chronic anxiety that I've had since I was a young kid and didn't know Mm -hmm. um, through severe chronic pain that I always chalked up to athletics or pushing so hard or staying up and studying. And then in residency, it was, you know, long work hours and stress and kids and all the things that now that I know is, is really complex pain syndrome, otherwise known as fibromyalgia interplayed with professional burnout as a female physician. So when did you first notice that the pain was showing up for you, even if you didn't have a name for it? My earliest like cognitive rec- like recognition of it was in high school. I um, I pushed hard, like in everything. I'm a pusher, but in athletics, you know, I would push myself harder. Um, I guess maybe it was even junior high when I was still swimming. Um, I was actually good enough that I practiced with the the older kids, and just I just hurt. But it was when I was in high school running track um, and I just was like, I just feel horrible. Like I still got up and went to school. I didn't complain because that's not what we do in our family. You know, those unwritten rules (laughs) that we all live by. Mm -hmm. Um, And I got on, you remember Vivox? Mm -hmm. It got taken off the market. It was like one of the first like Cox two or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I remember going to my my parents did finally take me to my family doctor and I got started on a sample of that. And like, I felt better with it, but I still had a lot of pain and I thought, well, this is just like what it is. So I think those were the first times when I was like, you know, something's not right. So you're this anxious kid who is high performing, super athletic, hurting, but without a place to talk about or normalize that. Yeah. I mean, it just, I thought that was the normal. So what did you do? Uh, I threw myself into work. Like at the time, of course, it was like academic work and being a part of almost every single student activity group possible and student council and then athletics. Um, Because I think now looking at it, if I could keep busy, it was a way to like dull and numb how I was feeling both anxiety, but also physically as well. And I can say, I think that very much contributes to what I now recognize is what led me through professional burnout and what I really feel like what I have is an underlying like work addiction. Uh Um, But that started super early. So how did that start? If I could just stay busy, I don't have to feel things that are uncomfortable physically or emotionally. Yeah. Or if I, or if I am the best, I get the Atta girls Mm -hmm. And that feels good. Mm -hmm. And that negates the feeling bad. Yeah. And you looked awesome on paper. On paper. I mean, I can remember my little brother being like, I can never do what you have done. And he kind of went in the opposite direction as like a rebel, rule breaker, that kind of thing, because of these standards I had kind of set inadvertently of what it meant to be um, who we were as a family. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I, of course I carried that in through like into undergraduate as well, played mm-hmm. sports, um, got a biology degree with a chemistry minor again, and a bunch of athletics, um, and in a bunch of clubs, president of biology club. I worked two jobs. So I waited tables and then I also lifeguarded. And then for a short time, I worked in a clothing store, <laughs> you know, like, doing all of the things. And part of it was out of necessity. Like I needed the money. Hence why, um, you know, I played sports in college for the scholarships. 
and the working too, I needed money at the time. But I really think some of it, you know, work really was my drug. The work I was doing was like drinking poison, though on the outside, it looked like a whole like wonderful thing. Well, in the short term, it gave you that, as you call it, the girl. It gave you that dopamine hit, that feeling of feeling really good, even if it was poison in the end. There's mm-hmm. the long-term price to pay for that. And I know you work in addiction medicine. Mm-hmm. And you know, as you know, I do eating disorder care. And we spend a lot of time unraveling why people make the decisions that they make, which is very, very complex. But however your brain chemistry was and the special set of circumstances that make you you, the girl was the thing that kept you moving forward mm-hmm. and not feeling pain, physical yeah. or emotional. Yeah. Physical pain or like the thought tornadoes, the like yeah. whirling. Like yeah. I didn't realize that that wasn't normal. Again, yeah. like in my world, that was just like, and this is just how it is. I think of a thousand different thoughts before 8 a.m. There was so many times that like, I think the anxiety is what I really felt was like my, my superpower Mm. that it like gave me a cutting edge. I could like multitask like a beast and I could just like push and push and push, but I would do those things and I would push so hard and then I would just crash Mm. like sleep for days or just not literally like feel like my body is broken. And it usually happened around like breaks from school. Mm -hmm. So I would like push so hard to get to Christmas break. And then I would just be like a blob on the floor and my family would be like, like, are you okay? And I'm just like, I would always just say, I'm just really tired. Mm -hmm. And, and, and of course, like they didn't see the forest through the trees either. I mean, I was very tired because I was like absolutely draining my tank into the negative and then trying to rest up so I could get into like the next semester. And I did that with med school too. And I think what got really hard with medical school is like, you still had those breaks like first and second year, but third year, like it was every month all year. And then boom, you're into fourth year. And then you were into residency and you had to start doing this thing called like plan PTO and like you didn't have very much. And then you had a call schedule. And so those, those breaks that I naturally had in a school schedule went away. And I think that is when, I really started to waver in my health Mm -hmm. inadvertently. Like I didn't, I didn't know at the time. So what was your first sign that you were not recovering well and not doing okay? Um, Had Camden, my first son, October of my intern year. So like literally three months into starting residency. Um, And I only had a very short time to be home and that brought up a lot of anxiety and having a child, first child, I, of course, like new mother stuff. And I didn't know what it was. I just know it felt horrible. Um, Mr. Dr. Wiseman, he didn't know what to do. Family was like, figure it out, you know? And of course I just like pulled myself up by the bootstraps and went back to work. Um, I did utilize the EAP program and went and talked to someone and they told me that I had postpartum depression, which, I mean, I guess I kind of fit the, the um, uh, definition for it, but it didn't feel quite accurate, but it wasn't until a couple of years ago when they came out with the, the diagnosis of postpartum anxiety Mm -hmm. that I was like, holy shit, that was me. Mm -hmm. Like that felt. And I need to mention too, like I actually sought out. um, I remember when I was in college, like I just felt off and I went and saw my primary care and, you know, I just told like, you just have a lot going on stress. You're going to be okay. Um, And I didn't do anything else about it. And then for second year of medical school, I remember I saw my doctor once and again, it was like, well, you're in medical school and it's really, really hard. And I now see those as like huge missed opportunities that if somebody would have done a little bit more asking, um, cause again, I'm looking at it from the patient's view. Like I wasn't doing well, mm-hmm. you know, I, I, they gave me the PHQ nine 
And, um, but that didn't fit what was going on with me at the time. Right. Depression right. came later. Yeah, that's right. And I think particularly for high functioning, anxious, depressed folks, they don't meet those criteria because there's not an impairment in function in their life. They're still yeah. showing up. They're still working 80 hours a week. They're still raising a family. But below the surface is all of the Bad. symptoms. Yeah, lots of badness. And for folks who are not innately prone to ask for help, just showing up in the doctor's office is a big enough red flag for me, at least. I know that now, but all those times that I similarly went to the doctor, they said, how are you? And I said, fine. And they said, great, let's move on. Um, that was a, a missed opportunity. I agree. I do that with my patients now and they say, fine. I'm like, good, fine, bad, fine, or fine, fine. <laughs> Two people told me yesterday, fine, fine. I'm like, well, tell me more. I say, how are you really? Uh, fine is uh, not a feeling, right? So, so yeah, that was kind of like where I was intern year, figuring things out. And of course, through all of this, I was going to be the best resident, right? Like, yeah. And so I stayed with the organization that I did residency with. I did get the location closer to the farm. But within like the first couple of weeks, I knew like, this is not better. Yeah. This is not better at all. Mm. And um, of course, by that time, the anxiety is so high that I'm not sleeping hardly any quality hours. I no longer have an attending that I can go talk to about. Like, I'm literally one of four doctors in the county now, and mm -hmm. I'm expected to like, take care of things. And I remember one, t one time I had, I think it was like a weird rash or a weird presentation. And I asked my nurse to go get one of my partners, like I needed help. And he came and looked and, you know, but he thought it was so bizarre to like ask for help or like somebody to, mm -hmm. because they were just so used to being alone yeah. and so kind of in the middle of nowhere. And like, you just kind of futzed around while you figured it out. Right. Um, it felt so unsettling and so insecure. I would get up in the middle of the night and log into my computer and check to see if labs were back yet because I was certain that I was going to kill someone because yeah. I was doing inappropriate management. One of my patients who, God, I love her and I miss her, um, was having some issues and we fought with her insurance company to get a simple CT scan and never could. We finally got him to get us a right upper quadrant ultrasound and she did have some gallbladder disease. And then when they took her to surgery, they're like, well, we just need to seal her back up because she's got cancer seeding all in her pair, you know, her nail cavity. all over her belly. Yeah. Cause I couldn't fucking get a CT scan. Yeah. And so it was like stuff like that in, you know, the heartland of Indiana with people who are good people who work really hard and don't always have the means. And I just, I, I mean, it was all the things. It was burnout. It was anxiety. It was, I just felt so terrible that I would pick up the boys from daycare at night and just bring them home. And I had like a gate system set up in our living room and I would let them watch TV and I would just lay hmm. like, and I had so much mom guilt about it, but I like, I physically could not do any more that day. And I was doing all the things though, Kara, I was like <laughs> running, I was going to exercise class and uh, walking at lunchtime and, but on the outside, it looked like I was killing it. It really did. And on the inside, I was so numb. Absolutely numb. It's, it's heartbreaking that all the thing, all the busyness that you were doing to be numb finally worked in that way where you actually mm -hmm. felt nothing i felt nothing except so, anger yes rage is accessible anger. yeah so of course you didn't say oh yeah i have anxiety because you didn't feel anxious you're just exhausted and mad yeah and scrolling online at 1 a.m trying to figure out a different job you know i was like i applied at the local toyota manufacturing plant 
I applied to be a marketing executive for a local bank. I mean, I was even at the point that I was like, I'll just do whatever just to try to pay the bills. Like nothing was going to pay me like being a physician was, at least that's what I thought at the time. I felt really, really stuck because, you know, like I mentioned, there's there's three clinics in town. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So it's not like I could just switch to another, nor did I really want to. Like I didn't. I didn't want to do what I was doing. Like I really wanted to quit. Um, And so I had two little boys and a scared husband and just felt like an other wreck. And uh, it's a, it's a really dark place. I mean, this is like a trigger alert, but I mean, I was suicidal. I knew what to do and I knew how to get it done. And I knew probably I could do it in a way that Craig could still collect on the life insurance. Hmm. And it wasn't, I didn't, I, at the time I had friends, but I don't, I don't really feel like I had anybody that I could call. Um, Craig was doing the best he could too at the time. Um, but it was those two little boys watching Paw Patrol that kept me anchored. And I'm yeah. so glad for that. But yeah. I mean, to be very honest, like I was done. Yeah, really done. How did you keep going? Well, me being the sass that I am, I talked to my immediate superior and told her I tried to find the words. I wish I had a recording of that conversation because I bet it was so messy. <laughs> but um, just saying, like, I don't know what's wrong with me, but like, I can't keep doing this. And she kind of revealed, she's like, well, actually, that's why I took the medical director position was because like I couldn't do it anymore either. Hmm. And she encouraged me. She's like, well, maybe think about leadership. And I was like, who the fuck am I going to lead? Like, I just got into medicine, like, you know, and then she's like, well, maybe an MBA or, you know, another degree. And like, at that point I was like, I'm barely keeping my shit together and showering every day. Like, there's no way I can do another degree. Were you getting medical care at this point? Like, did you name this for what it was? No, no. Because who was I going to go to? Like one of my partners? No way. Were you you self-prescribing? No, I never actually did that. Um, I tried to talk to some of my med school friends and they were either feeling the same way and they didn't have any answers or they were like, what are you talking about, Aaron? Like life is good. I was like, life is really not good. I told no one about the suicidal thoughts. I'll be honest. That was, that's now been about 10 years ago, nine years ago. And it, it's just in the last one to two years, I've actually like owned it and said out loud, like what was going on. So I got online. I mean, that, that was the best worst thing to do because best and of the thing that at the time, you know, I found the word burnout and what it meant and what people were talking about it. It was when Kevin MD was pretty young. Mm-hmm. I remember reading some stuff um, on his website. And I was like, okay, aha, like, this is what it is. Like, if I can name it, then I can figure it out. So like, once I had that, then I started collecting strategies, like which one of them is like cutting back on time. So I went and talked to our CMO and he obviously didn't want me to do that. Cause like I'm a year into practice and I'm already talking about cutting back. So what we did was we rearranged my schedule and I did five full days one week. And then I did four full days one week with one day off every other week. Hmm. And that just felt like rearranging the chairs on the Titanic. So I went back to him and said, like, listen, like, and I, I literally had the checkbook in hand, like in my hand when I walked in there about like, I'm going to sign back my forgivable loan because I hadn't spent it or like some definite changes need to be made. And I made some suggestions and they got kind of all shot down. And um, after I said I was quitting, they did finally adjust my schedule and I went to a 0.6. So I worked Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And those Tuesday, Thursdays were so hard at first because I felt like I needed to be cleaning. I needed to take care of the kids and not send them to daycare. 
I needed to like show up and be this other person when all I could really do was just like lay around. And it was actually my husband who gave me the permission to be like, I will take the kids to daycare. Why don't you just rest? Mm -hmm. And it was like a full year of just doing that. So I finally got to a place where I'm like, okay, like I can get up and. What did rest feel like? Horrible. Because if work is your drug, then rest is your detox. Yeah. It felt horrible because I, my whole life was built on how productive I could be. That's what my contribution was. That was my self-worth. So of course, like I rested some, but then I, I had, during that time I'd started working as a coach and I was like, where's all the young physician coaches? Because we need this shit. So of course I started my own business during that time as well. Because that's I so couldn't restful. Fully <laughs> back off. Yeah. Yeah. And also you built a business around helping other physicians with their own burnout, yes. right? So yes. there was a lot of identity in that and a lot of, this is, this is the thing. If we can just fix burnout, then I can feel better and I can help other people. Yeah, exactly. And I, I thought I was doing that and I, I think I was doing a pretty good job and there was more to the story. That's right. And you got to remember, I had done Reiki, I had done tapping, I have done all the like woo shit you can think about to help with burnout, help with uh, PTSD, all the things to this point that I was like, you know what, I help my clients get a psychiatrist, I need a psychiatrist. And so I, this was in 2020. It's the first time I met with my psychiatrist because it, it was when, yes, it was because remember telemedicine got loosened up because of COVID mm-hmm. and um, she was not, she's not in my state, but she has an Indiana state license. So I felt safe. Like mm-hmm. she wasn't like down the road, like mm-hmm. all my other partners. And I started talking to her about it and she's like, you know, have you ever, um, have you ever considered, you know, that you have, um, fibromyalgia. I said, I don't really talk about that because I know what fibromyalgia patients are. And like, I'm not that person. Mm. Um, because prior to this, I had seen a functional medicine doc and of course they wanted to treat me with not pharmaceuticals and like, it didn't work. Like I did the elimination diet. I did the like cleanses. I did all the shit. I ate vegan for a while and that about killed me not having cheese and eggs. And, um, and I told her, I was like, I've done the GAD seven and I've done the PHQ nine and they're better than what they had been in the past, but I still don't think they're good. And that's when I finally started on medication, but now being properly taken care of by my medical colleagues and having a still mind and I still have bad days with the fibromyalgia, but most days are better days than before. Like all that other stuff could help, but I really needed, I needed to doctor me first. I mean, the name of the podcast. Yeah. I needed the same treatments that I give to my patients every single day. You feel like you had no other choice and that's why you finally asked for that version of help or was it something else? I think it was coming to the point of recognizing that I am a human and human bodies have things happen to them and that no amount of success or mindset work or other things was going to make a difference because I had done all the other things. Yeah. And it, it honestly, I think I remember a day I was sitting down in my new FQHC that I started federally qualified health clinic where I now practice. And I thought with all the love and compassion that I give to the people I take care of, why can I not have this for myself to take mm-hmm. medicine? Yeah. Um, but I describe it as, me being a little duck trying to swim across the surface of the pond 
anxiety is the water. And when my anxiety is under control, it's like glass. Mm -hmm. And before it was like monsoon season. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like, it's still the work to get across the pond, but it's so much easier. And what I thought was my cutting edge by all the thoughts floating around in my head and flying those thought tornadoes. I now realize that my brain was, was altered and giving me all of these different what ifs and should haves and don't forgets and um, negative self-talk because that that's part of my anxiety as well is that it gets really, really mean is like, and it doesn't have to be like that. Mm -hmm. So that feels really good. I almost had regret that I hadn't reached reached out and got treatment before because I'm like, this is so much better. Mm. So to anyone who's listening to this and thinking maybe that's me, like what would you tell them? Let's I'm gonna reword the question. What would I tell my past self yeah. sitting where we are here today? I would tell past Aaron that things can be so much better and this is not your fault. It's not that you're not working enough. It's not that you're not trying enough, that there's just things going on within your body and mind for whatever, who knows, whether fucking reason, I don't even know. And it makes me, it makes me pissed because I want to have like a reason to say this, but that it doesn't matter what the, what is and how it became to become what it is, there is the moving forward and getting help and getting treatment so that you don't have to continually fight so many battlefronts because it wasn't just burnout. I now Mm -hmm. recognize there was so many battle lines that I was holding back Mm -hmm. and that's what made it so fucking difficult. Oh, dear friends, you see, this is not just you. I hear this story all the time. Who is someone that you can reach out to today if you are feeling the way that Aaron felt? Friend, family member, your physician, therapist, coach, just one person and say, I'm not okay. And if you have someone that you're worried about, please send this to them so they can know they're not alone too. And one favor for me, if you can like, rate and review the podcast. I'd really appreciate it. Until next week, take care of you. Hey friend. So my word of the year for 2023 is going to be slacking for two reasons. One, I am really going to pull back the throttle in 2023 and see what life is like when I just do enough, not extra, not overboard, not overworking, burning myself out, burning candle at both ends, slacking, something I don't think I've really ever done my entire life. I'm excited about it, but I'm also worried, of course, (laughs) the classic OCD overworker, how this is going to be. The other reason that slack is going to be my word in 2023 is that's where I'm going to hang out. You're not going to see me in a lot of new places. I'm just going to be waiting for you in my DMs on slack. Yeah, I'll probably occasionally post on Instagram and still send out a few emails But you're going to see a change in Burnt Out to Badass and Dr. Me First. You're going to just see me waiting willingly and quietly in the corner for those who are ready for help. No more blasting lots of advertisements and marketing and pushing people. When you're ready, you'll come and we're going to see how it goes. So there you go. That's my word for the year. How about you? Have you picked a word? I'd love to hear about it. Send me an email. Better yet, send me a DM in Slack. Or maybe you want to join me and let's make this the year of slacking. All right, friend. Remember, if work is your drug, rest is your recovery. Come over and hang out with Slack and me 
and start slacking off a little bit in life.